This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Massive sports weekend on tap here because we've got the third place game in the World Cup on Saturday, a three game slate in the NFL. We got the World Cup final on Sunday and of course all the NFL games there. We're going to break down all of that here today on Covering the Spread. Later on, we're going to have Dr. Ed Feng on to break down the World Cup final between Argentina and France. But first, we're going to talk to J.J. Zacharyson to get his read on some player props for Week 15. This is Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as mentioned, by J.J. Zacharyson. Check him out on Twitter at LateRoundQB. Find his work at LateRound.com and the Late Round fantasy football podcast jj we are on to week 15 which means saturday games are back in our lives how you doing today i'm good uh, i mean I, I could be better you know i faced george kittle in a couple of uh Rough. playoff matchups Rough. last night so you know an, an uphill battle uh now moving forward this weekend uh but aside from that things are good things are good yeah i have brock purdy in i uh, like half my dynasty leagues but the one where i needed uh, production was a Geno team. So I'm hurting as well. Uh, going to need some Tyree kill to overcome some weather on Saturday. Need Derek Henry to go bananas, which could happen. Josh Jacobs be healthy. It's uh, we're walking a pretty tight line here. We'll see how all that uh, plays out. But let's talk about some player props here for week number 15. And one of the key things for this is that we got a lot of teams with massive, massive implications, you know, playoffs in the line, which means we can expect them to keep their usage pretty similar, but some teams, may have an eye towards the future. So when you're judging a team, JJ, in terms of how to handle, like project their usage, what do you go through to decide whether or not a player is trustworthy when they're playing on a team that may not have a lot on the line this weekend? Yeah, I mean, first off, I I think we have to utilize beat writers and beat reporters. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they can give us insight on how teams are thinking about, uh, you know, these players and if they're going to use backups or if they're, you know, if if some quarterback's only going to play the first half or something like that. But I do think at the end of the day, two things. Number one, these guys are professionals. I think a lot of times uh, you can go on Twitter and on social media and you'll see people say that these teams aren't playing for anything. And therefore they're not going to try or something. I mean, like these guys are not only playing on a contract this year where right. they're, they're under contract, they're getting paid to do this thing, but number, you know, they're, they're professional athletes. I mean, they're, they're competitive uh, and they're also playing for future contracts and they're playing for what can happen after the season. And the vast majority of players in the NFL, you know, have a very volatile career path. You know, right. it's not like everyone's locked in to the same team and they're these all pro players. Um, so it's really important to keep that in mind. So I would say definitely look into what beat writers are saying, see if you can, you know, read between the lines and, and see if there's any coaching quotes that uh, are out there saying that they're going to approach things in an X, Y, Z manner. Um, but at the same time, don't overstate what this all means, because these guys are professionals at the end of the day, they're playing for something. Uh, you know, these, these contracts still matter. And, uh, you know, they're they're competitive player. I mean, they're in the NFL for a reason. So I think overall, it's really easy to overstate, you know, what this all sort of means. Um, yeah. So so definitely just sort of take all that evidence and, and, you know, utilize it. But, you know, don't take it too far because it's very easy to take it too far. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking motivation and there are more motivations than just playoffs. Uh, yeah. There are other stuff that matters, too. So yeah. Um, it's important not to whittle your list, your pool down to potential bets down to just the teams of playoffs on the line, because that's going to potentially have some value on the table um, and potentially leave you with nothing you can bet. Okay. We talked about the impact of wind previously, and that's on the table. Once again, this week got uh, 15 miles per hour for that Cleveland game, 12 miles per hour for Chicago, Philadelphia. That's all fine. And well, we talked about that before, but we're also getting to the point in the year where there are a lot of cold games and, I don't tend to factor coldness in, but I'm curious if I should. So I wanted to ask you, get your thoughts on it, kind of cheat, uh, use you as a guide here. Is temperature something you care about or can it be overhyped in analysis? I don't care about it that much. I mean, there's there's some instances where if it's like, you know, below freezing or, or sorry, below zero or something like that, um, you know, you can probably say that this team is, is not going to be throwing the ball as much. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think that we care a lot more about wind. We care a lot more about heavy rain, you know, a little bit of rain is whatever, but heavy rain matters, uh, heavy snow, um, you know, 
you'll, you'll see teams lean on the run a little bit more in those types of environments. But when you're talking about cold versus warm weather, you know, I think this is another narrative driven thing where, uh, you know, we, we, we hear people talk about in the media all the time about how, oh, it's December football. You got to yeah. run the ball and uh, you got to approach things that way. I think there's something to that to some degree with some teams in some environments. You know, I think that like in Green Bay and in Lambeau, when it's below zero, maybe they lean on A.J. Dillon a little bit more or something like right. that. Um, but overall, you know, it, it's not something that I'm, I'm drastically changing my numbers for. Um, and, and I don't think books are either. Uh, at the end of the day. So I worry a lot more about uh, precipitation um, and, you know, these like big snowstorms and stuff, because in snow uh, teams do run the ball more and running backs can actually be effective in those environments because they know where they're going and they can break defenders ankles uh, because the defenders don't have good footing. Uh, Whereas, you know, when it's cold uh, you know, these guys are, are warmed up enough. I mean, you see these, these psychotic offensive linemen going out there without, without any uh, long sleeves on. And these like, you know, two degree temperatures, um, you know, they're, they're warm enough. They're fine enough. Um, it's not something that I'm going to, uh, you know, really, really, um, you know, weigh things heavily towards. Yeah. Mike McDaniel, the coach of the dolphins this week has been talking a lot about how the cold doesn't matter trying to, you know, I think he's trying to like get in his, his team's head, be, tell them like, Hey, calm down. It'll be fine. But I really want him to come out in like shorts and like a, a cutoff tank for yeah. the game on Saturday. Like, I, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility for him specifically because he's kind of a psycho. Um, I'm hoping he does that. I think we want to see it from a coach, not just yes. uh, from the offensive lineman. Now, let's take a look at some situations you are targeting for this week. JJ, which situations in flux do you think may present us with some value once props are opened at respective books? Yeah, there's a lot this week. I mean, you know, you have the Lions backfield that continues to be a mess. Uh, DeAndre Swift two weeks ago in week 13, he had a 51% snap share that fell to a 36% snap share this past week. So just be aware, you know, in that backfield that things are fluctuating a lot. But in that same game, I'm really intrigued by what's going on with Corey Davis. You know, he missed practice yeah. yesterday. You know, I've been assuming that he's going to be out all week just because of that concussion. Um, so if he is out, then Elijah Moore you know, last week, you know, throughout the season, we've seen Elijah Moore, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, the coaching staff hasn't been totally pleased with him and, and what he's done and what he's said off the field. But, um, you know, throughout the season, we've seen like Denzel Mims run ahead of Elijah Moore. Um, and last week, though, when Corey Davis was sidelined, Elijah Moore played as the number two wide receiver for the Jets. Uh, and he played still a large uh, percentage of his snaps from the slot. And in this matchup against Detroit this week, you know, Elijah Moore, let's just say Corey Davis is out. Elijah Moore is on the field a little bit more, but a lot of his snaps will be from the slot. And Detroit has given up the most receiving yards to slot wide receivers this season. So, uh, you know, once things open up a little bit there, once we know uh, what Corey Davis situation and the status is, uh, you can attack an Elijah Moore prop potentially. Uh, Alvin Kamara uh, is another one that I think is pretty intriguing because we we have sort of this idea of Kamara right now and, and perception that he's just not very effective, not very good, which isn't totally wrong. Um, last time we saw New Orleans back in week 13, because they had a bye last week, Mark Ingram was at a 42% snap share and he had an 18% target share. Uh, Alvin Kamara was at a 59% snap share, which isn't that high. Um, but, but uh, you know, if you, if you look at what's going on there now, Mark Ingram is sidelined. He's not going to be playing. And now they get really favorable matchups down the stretch. Uh, the Saints team does. So I, I'm kind of intrigued by Kamara just because perception is pretty down on him overall, but his peripherals have been pretty strong. He's seen a double digit percentage target share in every single game this year. Uh, he just hasn't been able to find the end zone that much because of Taysom Hill and uh, just the fact that they're, you know, it's not the most effective offense in the world. Um, but I, I do think that he's, he's at least pretty intriguing because his peripherals have still been there. And I highly mm -hmm. doubt new Orleans is going to trust another running back the way they trusted Mark Ingram uh, the last time out aside from Alvin Kamara, of course, and then the last situation uh, that I'm, I'm really interested uh, in is the Cincinnati backfield. So Joe Mixon has this concussion. He's out for two weeks, and then he comes back this past week, and he plays 59% of Cincinnati snaps, which is his lowest snap share of the season in a game that he completed. Samaje P. P Ryan ended up running more routes than him. So I think at the very least, you know, we saw P. Ryan play really well while, while Joe Mixon was out, and I think that they're rewarding him. Uh, you know, Mixon last week had his lowest – target share of the season at six percent uh p ryan again playing that role and he's played the pass catching role you know over the last couple of seasons uh for cincinnati but Mixon earlier this year was seeing decent target shares which we hadn't really seen from him uh you know throughout his career really um and so 
with the way that P Ryan played while Mixon was out. And it's not like Mixon came back from like a knee injury or some right. ankle injury. So it was a, con- it was a concussion, which, you know, is a very big deal, but from yeah. a, the standpoint of how teams approach these players, it's not really a ramp up type situation. It's, it's, you can play or you can't play uh, when you have a concussion. And so the fact that they split the backfield up the way that they did makes me far less bullish on Joe Mixon. And I think that if you're t- attacking mix and unders, I would turn towards the receiving markets and yes. the rushing plus receiving because the rushing yep. markets, I actually think he's pretty lively there because Vita Vea yeah, is not going to play for Tampa Bay this week. So I'd focus specifically on the pass catching, taking advantage of how involved P Ryan was there playing the two minute role like he did last year. I think it just kind of a reversion to last year and Nixon can yep. still be good there, but I'd focus more so on the pass catching with the Camara thing you were talking about. I think it's not just the Mark Ingram thing, but you look at the schedule they faced before their bye week. Tampa Bay with Vita Vea and Akeem Hicks. Really tough matchup there. San Francisco, been among the best defenses in football recently. The Rams before the Aaron Donald injury, I believe. I believe he was playing in that game. Yeah, he was. Uh, and then they faced Pittsburgh. I think that was with TJ Watt, but without Minka Fitzpatrick in that game. But Watt's mm-hmm. a big difference maker even against the run. And then Baltimore with, with, I think, Roquan Smith as well. So they faced a lot of tough defenses since that Raider game where Kamara had the three touchdowns or whatever it was. So it's not just Ingram. It's also that they faced a very difficult strict schedule there. Now I've had a bye week to get Kamara healthier, to get that offensive line healthier. I agree with you where I think Kamara, we might be overstating how bad yeah. those struggles have been. Let's open things up and talk about some yardage props you like across week 15. Where are you seeing value right now there? Yeah, uh, you know, one guy that I like as a sleeper this week in fantasy, um, and you can attack the over uh, on his yardage prop, is Alec Pierce. It's at 38 and a half receiving yards right now. You can get that in most books. Uh, Minnesota, this this secondary, has been beyond atrocious. I mean, they've been really, really bad. I think there is some fear with Pierce and with any pass catcher for Indianapolis that, uh, you know, they don't push the ball down the field at all. I mean, Matt Ryan has by far the lowest deep ball rate in football this season. He's thrown it. 15 plus air yards on fewer than 8% of his attempts when the league average is usually between like 17 and 19%. Uh, so, you know, we, we do have to keep that in mind, but Minnesota's allowed the most receiving yards to perimeter wide receivers this year. Uh, they rank third in percentage of wide receiver targets that get funneled to the outside. Uh, and Pierce is a perimeter guy. Uh, and not only that, but over uh, two of his last three games, he's seen a 26% and a 23% target share. Um, and even though he's a rookie, which we've talked about this before, we talked about this last week, even though he's a rookie where we'd, we'd expect there to be a ramp up here, especially for a, a second rounder, you know, he's not even like a, a stud prospect coming in who got drafted in the first round. Um, but despite the fact that he's a rookie, he's actually hit this over in half of his games this year. So you get a brilliant matchup against Minnesota, the best matchup arguably that you could find for Alec Pierce. Um, but you know, he's already, you know, even in an even matchup, you could argue that you could go over here, at least from a 50, 50 standpoint. So I really, really like Alec Pierce this week. I think over 38 and a half yards makes a lot of sense. Um, and then another another receiving uh, prop that I like is Mike Evans going under 58 and a half receiving yards. Um, he's been he's been bad over the last five games. I mean, that's that's just the, the, the way to put it, the easiest way to put it. Um, he's actually only hit this over once over his last five games. And when he hit the over, it was 59 receiving yards when this is 58 and a half. So <laughs> he barely got over in that one game. A huge reason for this Mike Evans slide uh, is that they're just not pushing it down the field to him. I mean, from weeks one to eight, 37% of his targets were 15 plus air yards. Uh, since then, that number has been 21%. So far, far lower uh, than it was to start the season. Cincinnati, though, they they do see a lot of targets down the field. They've seen actually the fourth highest rate of targets going 15 plus air yards, but they've only allowed, uh, they have one of the best uh, completion rates against on those throws. So, you know, it's likely because teams are playing catch up a little bit against Cincinnati and they're trying to keep pace with Joe Burrow and all that. Uh, but they've, they've been able to defend that type of pass fairly well this year. So given the trends with Evans, I think it's a fairly safe bet to go under 58 and a half receiving yards. Uh, going back to the Pierce one, there have only been 10 instances this year where a Colts receiver has had multiple deep targets in a game. Four of those have been by Pierce. So when they do go downfield, it's often to Alec Pierce. And the mm-hmm. Vikings do let a pretty high A dot, as you mentioned. So uh, Pierce, I think, is in a good spot for this week. Let's shift focus now and talk about some touchdown props. Where are you seeing value there for week 15? Yeah, so right now you can get J.K. Dobbins at plus 220 uh, as an anytime touchdown scorer over on FanDuel Sportsbook. 
Um, that number is not nearly as attractive on other books. Um, you know, he ended up seeing half of Baltimore's running back rushes last week against Pittsburgh. He led the backfield in snap share. You know, I, I know he had that long run and he looked a little bit uh, gimpy uh, while, while running down the field. Um, but he did see a decent amount of work last week, all things considered, in a, in a backfield that usually splits up the backfield. I mean, let's let's keep that in mind. Like, we're not expecting J.K. Dobbins, uh, you know, to see an 80 percent running back rush share or anything like that in that backfield. Um, but he also saw the only goal line rush on Baltimore last week. So they're clearly not afraid to use him there. Um, Cleveland, uh, their opponent this week, they've been beat on the ground this season. Uh, they have a bottom 10 success rate allowed to running backs. Uh, and you'd have to imagine that given Baltimore's quarterback situation, no Lamar Jackson, they're going to attack them on the ground. They're going to use their running backs. And they're they're going to deploy them. So I think J.K. Dobbins can be projected for 12 to 17 touches in this game. Um, and if that's the case, then he could find the end zone pretty easily. Uh, so plus 220, I really like those odds. So J.K. Dobbins, you get that over on FanDuel Sportsbook. Yeah, the total in that game is super interesting because I think they it kind of assumes that Tyler Huntley was not going to get clear, but he did. Mm -hmm. It's gone up a point, uh, but I feel like it's still a bit low where it's currently sitting. So Dobbins, I think that's a good thing for him in terms of if the total is low, that correlates to anytime touchdown markets and stuff like that. And like you said, the usage last week was pretty good for a Ravens running back uh, and Huntley good to go. It should help everyone in that offense. That is JJ Zacharyson. Check him out on Twitter at late round QB. Find late round.com and the late round fantasy football podcast, wherever you get your podcast, JJ, good luck to you in week number 15. Happy holidays to you since we don't have a show uh, next week. So happy holidays to you and uh, good luck in the fantasy playoffs as well. Thanks Jim. Appreciate it, man. All righty. Once again, check out JJ on Twitter at late round QB. We're going to bring on Dr. Ed Fang to talk about the world cup final between Argentina and France in just one second. But first with only a handful of Monday night football games remaining this season, FanDuel and Visa are coming together to make the sure the excitement surrounding Monday nights is at an all time high. Introducing Monday night, perfect picks presented by Visa, a free to play contest on FanDuel that gives you a chance to win a share of $10,000 in cash prizes, courtesy of Visa. Here's how it works. You'll be presented with 10 questions centered around on-field action for Monday night's NFL game. Fans who answer the most questions correctly win a share of the $10,000 prize pool. It's that easy. The contest is now live. So head to FanDuel.com slash free slash contest slash Visa Perfect Picks and make your picks before Monday night. That's FanDuel.com slash free slash contest slash Visa Perfect Pick. No purchase necessary. Age and location restrictions apply. Void were prohibited. See full terms at FanDuel.com. Visa and its financial institutions have not sponsored or offered this motion in any way. Okay. Let's bring now on Dr. Ed Fang. You can find Ed over at thepowerrank.com and find him on Twitter at the Power Rank. And Ed, we've got the World Cup final coming up on Sunday, third place game on Saturday. How you doing? I'm doing really well. It's been a busy week, but uh, I can't complain because I get to uh, you know provide good bull numbers for my people. And then we got a World Cup final to talk about, which I think is uh, particularly interesting. So I'm looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, I was uh, getting my college football DFS lineup set before we came on the show for today. Got it. Had to get set for uh, the first game at eleven thirty. We're recording at ten, uh, like ten o'clock in the morning. So I had to, I had to get ready. I'm not like opposed to like day games, but like I want a little bit more wiggle room to get my stuff done before the games lock at eleven thirty. Well, ten, I mean, eleven thirty on a Friday morning is like kind of a crazy ask for bowl season to start. Yeah, I, I would say that like that's the only game that locks then. So yeah. for some reason that you don't, you know, you don't right. get right. around to this until tomorrow in the morning, you're only missing two games. You give them the lowest confidence points and you can still go on. Right. Yeah. But uh, I was, uh, I needed more time to do my DFS research, but hopefully uh, I don't waste that money. Okay. Let's focus on the world cup final right now. We're going to talk to you about like the actual markets in a second here. Uh, Cause it's basically a toss up based on what FanDuel has right now, but from a top down perspective, what's your view of this matchup between France and Argentina? I had Argentina overrated coming into this tournament that uh, hasn't quite looked so good. Um, but my numbers, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like, we'll talk about my numbers in a bit, but I think they've been pretty spot on Argentina, and they're pretty close to the markets right now. So I'm pretty pleased with that. It almost seems like kind of everything's kind of converging to, to what my numbers had. Lionel Messi is still the best soccer player in the world, probably. He's still amazing. 
Uh, I don't really have a ton of confidence in the rest of that team, but they played really well. Uh, they defensively, they have been amazing. They didn't let Croatia do anything that they wanted to do in the midfield. And, you know, you have to tip your hat to them for that. But as far as who scares you on this team, it's, it's messy and, 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 and messy. Uh, <laughs> Astro France, still one of the most talented teams in the world. Um, so one thing I am looking forward for them, uh, Ravio, their midfielder, uh, was sick. He actually was in the hotel for the semifinal. He was so sick that he couldn't uh, even make it onto the bench. Um, it looks like he's on track to get back by Sunday. And so that's definitely a positive. France came into the tournament without their top two choices at defensive midfield. And so they they put – I mean, they made – they, they put two other guys out there who start for Juventus and Real Madrid, which is a luxury that not many yeah. nations in the world have. And then finally you get to their fifth choice at, at central midfield. And I didn't think he was that good. I thought Morocco was able to like have a lot of space in the midfield to make runs uh, during that game, which is really not what you expect from Morocco. So I do think Rabiot really does matter. Uh, France has been excellent since then. Um, so that's definitely something I'm keeping an eye on. There's also the uh, the defender, Umpa Picano. I wish I could say his name. He's a Bayern <laughs> Munich defender. He's usually very good. Uh, mm. I thought he was terrible against England, made a bunch of mistakes. There was actually probably a penalty that could have been called on him. Um, but he he's the other player that actually did not end up starting, which wasn't really a problem because you just – take Liverpool's first choice central defender and, and put him in there, which is, which is a, also again, a nice luxury. Um, yeah. So, so those are the things I'm kind of looking at. Um, mm -hmm. We can actually, let's, let's also talk about penalties. Yeah. This game is going to be close. Uh, this game's going to be tight. That's going to figure into some of the bets that, that I'll talk about in a little bit. Rhino Hanlon did a really nice study uh, about penalty kicks. And the thing that really stands out, and the work that he did is Leo Messi's not actually the best in the world. So they had a sample of about 108 penalty kicks uh, in the database, and he makes them at about 80%, which mm -hmm. is roughly the Premier League average. Um, it kind of strikes me as dumb because he's kind of good at everything else. So you yeah. want to think it's a small sample size. And so I actually dug into the error rate, and it's about 4%. Um so, you know, I mean, there's 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 guys that are certainly better than him over a pretty decent sample. Um, I still think it might be small sample size. I think that guy's pretty good at striking a ball. And if you're and so we know statistically that he's very good at striking a ball. Yeah. And so for you would think to, that translates directly to that. You, you would think that that translates. It hasn't in the data, but um, you can certainly uh, you can certainly question that. Um, you know, the French keeper has a. Uh, in the data actually never made a penalty kick save um, 0 for 13. And this was before the quarterfinals. And um, yeah, that also doesn't make sense. He's a pretty good yeah. keeper. So, uh, you know, you're looking for any edge. I don't, I don't really looking at that. I, I don't necessarily think there's any edge for either team in, in penalties. Um, but, but we shall see some, so some interesting stuff there. So you mentioned that your numbers are in line with the market. And right now the market has Argentina minus 110, uh, France minus 106 at FanDuel Sportsbook on the money line. So this is after all things are said and done. All right, that's uh, that's to actually win the whole thing. Right yeah. now a tie after 90 minutes um, plus extra time is plus 195. Um, you got uh, Argentina plus 175, France plus 180. So it's kind of pick your poison here. Are you seeing any value in those more traditional markets right now? Yeah, actually, you know, FanDuel had France as a slight favorite, which I thought was correct. And, and now they are not the favorite, which I think is slightly incorrect. I do think France is a slightly better team. My numbers have it at about 53% that they're going to lift the trophy. Uh, so I did take a nibble at, at France. I think I got, yeah, minus 106 this morning. I, I, I think there's the ever slightest of values there and uh with with an interest in just having something on the outcome of the game i think i think that was enough for me to pull the trigger there okay so a little bit of edge there france minus 106 you can still get that wherever you're betting you mentioned the penalty kicks diving into that and trying to find value elsewhere and like 
there are 16,000 markets to bet. I'm sure you've not looked at all of them because that's a lot. But uh, yeah. do you see anything else you liked uh, over at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, actually not on FanDuel, but on okay. another sports book that rhymes with Daft Kings. Uh, you can bet <laughs> on even odd uh, total goals. Yeah. And I kind of really like this bet. Because yeah. you're never dead, right? Yeah. You bet an over under, you're dead at some point. Right. If you bet a spread, you can be dead at some point. Yeah. With with even odd goals, you're never dead. It's kind of fun, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, for example, I had uh, even goals in in England, France, and uh, what happened? So so France is up two nothing, right? And then England comes back and they they hit a penalty, and, and, and so Harry Kane hits a penalty and it's two one. You're like, oh man, that's a bummer. And then, uh, and then King gets another penalty. You're like, oh, you're back into it, right? So right, right. you're going even odd, even odd. Like you're never really out of it. It's kind of like a fun sweat, you know? Did you like, actually want that persist. sweat in the Netherlands game though? I know you won that bet, but like, I feel like that took years off your life. You had even goals in that one. They were down had, to nothing. They score a goal to make it odd number. Yeah. And then they score again. I feel like that, like from a life expectancy perspective, might not have been worth the money you won. Yeah. So no, actually, I, I would argue that it was pretty fun. I actually decided <laughs> to go get my kids when it was two nothing Argentina, and yeah. then they scored, and I was kind of getting updates from my friend that I had left, and then I actually got back home in time for that goal. And the, yeah. the second Netherlands goal was just a beautiful set piece. Um, you know, it's one of these things where you fake kicking it over the wall, and you just actually pass it to someone that's right in the middle of the box, and he ends up scoring. And so there was a lot of excitement and joy over that. And I kind of missed all the drama because, um, because I was I was dumb enough to decide to pick up my kids during that time. <laughs> Being a good dad, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I haven't been a good dad every game, so let's just, let's just be clear about that. Um, anyways, even odd goals in the World Cup final, you can actually get even odds over at that other sports book and. It should really, really, really be slanted towards even, mm -hmm. essentially, because this is going to be a low scoring game. It's going to be tight. It's going to be defensive. And these are two really evenly matched teams as well. So minus 110 on even goals. Um, yeah, that's actually probably my favorite favorite bet uh, out there right now. So you prefer and, that over the France uh, to lift the cup at minus 106? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's the slightest of edges. I probably would have never bet that if the market hadn't sure. moved. Yeah. Um, you know, like if, if it's France, I mean, I think it'll probably end up France minus 120 minus 140. Okay. Something. And and France minus 120 is like kind of spot on. Yeah. Uh so yeah. Um yeah, even even number of total goals is okay. Uh, and and it's a it's a 90 minute thing too. Right, exactly. So yeah. you get to relax uh you can be live the entire game no matter what that's always exciting so yeah. a fun little sweat for a sunday morning in the world cup final ed uh you did send along your bowl report to me a thank you b you Absolutely. mentioned that you made some tweaks at the end of that so what yeah. were those tweaks you made uh to the bowl report before you let you go here uh in case people you know are trying to get in on bowl pools again probably missing out on that first bowl but potentially getting in for the afternoon one yeah, absolutely. Just in this era of opt-outs and transfers, I thought it'd be appropriate to kind of look at what the markets have because they're going to consider that more than my right. numbers, which don't consider it at all. So oh, I took the point spreads at Circa. I ranked them. And, you know, it wasn't really the best sort because, you know, there's like seven games that are lined at two and a half right now. Um, obviously, you can make micro adjustments above and beyond that based on my numbers, based on other metrics that you, you do see. But it was something that I thought was essential for my people to look at this week. You know, if you really want to do your homework, I think that's a, a crucial piece of information. And just for example, you know, like, uh, so LSU ended up being a 14 point favorite over Purdue. And I was, I actually think I, it was at 11 and I thought 11 was too much. Yeah. And then it moved to 14. And then, you know, there's an obvious reason for that. Aiden right. O'Connell, the Purdue quarterback has opted out. Jim, I don't know about this one, man. This kid, this kid is not exactly going to get drafted, right? Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that he's going to dish his guys. You know, it's not like he's a first round pick yeah. by any stretch, right? I'm very curious if like his family stuff played into that. Like maybe he just wanted to spend time with his family, not prep for the bowl game, given the stuff that went down there. Because oh, like sure. I, I thought it was curious too, and I, I don't think it's I, because I, like it's hard to envision that being an NFL thing. 
I believe from what I read, it said NFL and nothing. Yeah, I'm guessing that's like what it said, but like, yeah, I don't know. It it was, I, it came across as odd to me as well. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I kind of thought the markets were too high on that. 14 just seems like a lot. It it seems like a lot of points um, for uh, an LSU team. They'll probably have their starting quarterback back, but yeah. You know, given all the, you know, there should be a lot of opt outs on both sides of that game. I, I think that just makes it a closer game. Um, but the markets do have it at 14. I think that's something important to consider. Uh, that actually makes it one of the higher ranked games, you know, whereas I actually have, uh, I think, Marshall over Connecticut as, as my highest ranked game. Yeah. Because UConn was pretty bad coming into the season and actually had a right. remarkable season to make a bowl, but, you know, might be a good team to fade. So, uh, yeah. So, anyways, I think uh, just in this current era, uh, it's important to look at that piece of data when you're uh, assigning confidence points to these games. And and so that's all in um, my bull report. If you want to check it out, you can go to thepowerrank.net. Uh, I think I actually just tweeted out a link to get that as a separate service. So you can go to my Twitter at the Power Rank. Um, yeah. So go check it out. And like betting markets are going to always be one of the most efficient things we can lean on. So if you're, they're going to give you yeah. a signal towards which direction to shift things, we should probably listen right. to what the markets are saying. Yeah, uh, but I think absolutely. that's what exactly what you're doing, and it makes absolutely all the sense in the world. Absolutely. All right. As Ed said, you can find that bull report by going to thepowerrank.com. Check out Ed on Twitter, at the Power Rank. Ed, uh, I want to wish you a happy weekend. Enjoy the World Cup. Enjoy the bowl games. Have a delightful time rooting for France for you to get that ticket and even goals as well. And uh, we'll talk to you once again soon. Thanks, Jim. Talk soon. All righty. Check out Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am on Twitter at Jim Sadis. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Do not forget to subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Happy holidays to all of you. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 